the high school kids here, yes, here, thank you. Uh, here. Uh, and that's been one of the most wonderful things about what we've done with this is really engaging these kids and they're going to be the, uh, we get all the, all us old people get to pump the leading edge ideas to these guys and they're going to change the universe for us, hopefully. So, which is what he's going to talk about tonight too, actually. Uh, so I also get to uh, uh, introduce Dr. Bucciarelli this evening. Um, he's a prof currently professor emeritus, recently retired uh, from uh, MIT. He's been at MIT for like 35 years, a long time. He's a professor of engineering and technology studies. He teaches even now some of the um, structural dynamics courses and all the you know the heavy engineering courses. But also got into doing some history of engineering and thinking very deeply about the actual design process itself. A uh, number of case studies. He has two great books, which I, I highly recommend. Both his books. One called Designing Engineers, and the other one called Engineering Philosophy. Uh, very leading edge thinking about how we do stuff in the, the engineering as a, as a broad social enterprise, not as some sort of nerdy thing. Anyway, that's which is one of the reasons we invited him here because he is one of the leading edge guys in thinking and uh, researching this. He, he did his uh, undergraduate, he got a um, bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Cornell originally and then followed that up with a master's degree in aeronautical engineering again at Cornell. Then he moved over to MIT. Well, actually, in, the, in between, he taught at the um, Air Force uh, Institute of Technology for a couple of years. And then he went on uh, to MIT, got his PhD in aeronautical and astronautical engineering, and then became a professor there and has been teaching there for forever and, and as an institution and a, a real leading light in, in uh, the whole the culture of, uh, of MIT. So um, tonight, he's going to enlighten us. Thanks for that. So, yeah, we just have had him at two sessions already. I'm very impressed with what he has to say and how he says it. So, will you help me welcome Dr. Larry Bucciarelli? Thank you. Hopefully, that one's so done. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening. I first wish to thank the Institute for Science, Engineering, and Public Policy for inviting me here to speak to you this evening. Engineers ordinarily are not heard from in such a setting, a beautiful setting. We rarely make the evening news appear in the science section of the Times, nor take the stage at a main, as the main attraction at a Ticketron event like this. Scientists seem to receive all the attention, but I'm not jealous for doing engineering offers many of the same rewards as doing science. It's just that our productions do not earn us comparable recognition as individuals. Perhaps the reason why engineers as heroic individuals don't shine through in the media is that engineering accomplishments we do celebrate, here for example is the uh, Spirit, the Mars rover, these projects are the product not of the efforts of one person working at a laboratory bench, but of a heterogeneous collection of individuals, including not only project managers, but policy makers, representatives of a government agency, scientists, as well as engineers of many different colors. Uh, those people are looking at the first 3D image, images trans, transmitted back from Mars. And the image on the right is a, uh, that's three centimeters across, taken with a microscopic. Uh, viewing instrument. And the big image, the long image, is a uh, low sun from low ridge. That was taken relatively recently. Scientists as individuals, as individual heroes, fare much better in history. We have Newton's laws, Planck's constant, the Salk vaccine, Fermat's last theorem. I don't know if you can see that. I don't think Newton ever visited Dubai and I'm not sure there even was a Dubai in the late 17th century. But anyway, here he's on their stamp. Engineering accomplishments carry labels too, but labels of places, of the gods, a marketer's concoction. Here's the Brooklyn Bridge, the Erie Canal, the Apollo program, and an Apple iPod. There are exceptions. There's the Eiffel Tower, 
Bell Telephone and the Edsel Automobile. I'm not sure Mr. Edsel was very proud of that one, but anyway. The fact that an engineering production requires the collaboration of a team, a group of individuals with different competencies, responsibilities, and interests makes the study and analysis of engineering practice and engineering values, my subject tonight, makes it a messier affair. On the other hand, this messier state of affairs makes for more realism, less fantasy, less hype, less spin. It's my belief that we need less of the spin, less of this, and more down-to-earth, grounded renderings of science, of engineering, of technology. The opportunities these afford, but also their costs as well as their benefits. So this evening I want to take you inside engineering a bit to explore with you what engineers do, the kinds of challenges and problems they confront, how they design, and the rewards they accrue. I'll try to move beyond description of practice also and talk about their motivations, beliefs, norms, about what constitutes good engineering, a good product, a good design. Now, I'm obviously not going to report on a, a thorough study, scientific study, or offer you correlations. I'm going to give you my experiences from observing engineers at work. I'm interested, too, in how they view, how engineers view the customer, their clients and users of their productions. Why, would we, why should we take a closer look? Why explore engineering practice? We all acknowledge that we live in a world that is, that is more artifactual, less natural. Our landscape is more and more of our own doing. With our technical understanding, coupled with human enterprise, we construct, reconstruct our own nature, a techno-nature. And this at all scales, from the local and micro, the lawnmower, the leaf blower, even the grass, to the macro and global, the ATM, the internet, emissions from the power plant that don't abide by state boundaries. Who can decide, who can, we can ask, what determines who decides what our technological future will bring? Who shapes our technical environment? Who's in control? Is anyone in control? Now, I don't claim that engineers alone are responsible. But engineers do play a role, and my claim is that even though they may appear to be severely constrained within a firm, working to the dictates of management, though that's a suspect too, engineers do participate, certainly, in consort with managers, policymakers, and again, government agencies. And certainly, they have to pay attention to consumers and users. And that these decisions fix the form and fabric of our techno-nature. So it would seem advantageous if we are to all work toward a better techno-environment, that we would better understand what is possible, what improbable, what might conflict with the laws of science, what's allowable, and not relegate that decision-making to authorities or give in to defeatist theories that claim an autonomy for technology, that there's some kind of inner logic that drives technology and we just have to stand aside. Nor to romantic notions about progress towards hydrogen economies, ever-increasing productivity, benefits to all humankind somewhere off in the future. It might be easier to ignore technology, what engineers do, to keep it disjoint behind a sort of an Oz-like curtain and let market pull and science push two common theories about how we get the technology we do. Let these dominate. But this won't do. I want to pull back the curtain shielding engineering design from its public, from us. What we find when we go inside the firm, here I put in a plug for my book, Designing Engineers, which is about what goes on in, within the firm. Hello. <laughs> Designing is a very human and social enterprise, grounded for sure in science and hard technique, but a, profit, a process rife with uncertainty and ambiguity and opportunity. We find, too, that there are certain values inherent in the systems of knowledge and methods and know-how, beliefs that engineers rely on that both enable and constrain the way they think about their activities and their productions. Values that, along with Newton's laws, Planck's constant, define their goals, methods, and results. 
the technology we get to live with. So values matters as much as science. The social is as important as the instrumental. I'm going to pay particular attention to the way participants in design think about how they value the user. What do engineers do? First, a broad look, an overview, bird's eye view. The first thing to note is that engineers do many different things. They fill many different kinds of jobs. Some work for private firms and corporations. Others work for public agencies and under government contract. Some work on transportation systems, on energy systems, agricultural systems, communication systems, defense systems, space systems, and even on financial and banking systems. Where do many of our graduates from electrical engineering and computer science go? They go to work on Wall Street. Some are educated in the traditional engineering disciplines of mechanical, chemical, civil, and electrical engineering. More recently, there are graduates of bioengineering, software engineering, computer science, environmental engineering. Some have, always, some have always become teachers. And many go on to do other things, medicine, law, business, management. In fact, a little side note here, a little bit of data, hard data. Engineers do change jobs and enter occupations other than engineering. This figure taken, from, which is a little confusing, I'll try to explain, taken from an issue brief of the division of, of, uh, at NSF shows that of 2.2 million persons surveyed claiming to have a degree in engineering, you see the 1.0 and the 2 point, and the 1.2, that's the big circle on the left is uh, those they surveyed who claimed they had a degree in engineering. One million of them, roughly 40%, stated that their principal occupation as of 1995 was not in engineering. So 40% of our engineering graduates out of this particular sample, very large sample, are no longer doing engineering, or at least they think they're no longer doing engineering. And it probably reflects that they're no longer doing what their faculty told them engineering was doing. So they, they, they were doing engineering probably at some earlier time, but then they went, went on to get a second degree, a lot in management, many in, in medicine probably, and law. One of my best students went on to do patent law. One way to get at what engineers do is to compare what they do with what scientists do. Now this next slide you may have seen, some of you. It's taken from a talk by Carrie Snyder, uh, who gave a talk to the OPAS organization here a year or two ago. He's Vice President for Education Programs at Boston's Museum of Science. And in this slide he shows, he claims that the process of science and engineering are similar, but they have different goals. In science, you identify a question, research the question. Comparable to identify a question, engineers define a problem. Science, you research the question. Engineering, you research the problem. Generate ideas, generate solutions. So on, you can read it. Certainly the goals of science are different from those of engineering. Scientists, according to the textbooks, seek to reveal nature's laws. Scientists seek the truth. Engineers, on the other hand, seek to make things work to our advantage. But the slide's comparison process is severe, seriously deficient. It says nothing about who is doing the science, who is doing the engineering. For example, I, I would wager that most of you who view this slide have in the back of their minds, if you think of it, an image of a single agent, perhaps themselves. But why not two persons, even a girl and a boy? Or maybe it's a team of five or even of 500 engineers, all dispersed around the globe, defining the problem, researching the problem, generating the solutions, creating a prototype. How does this matter? Well, my last conjecture points to a problem of contemporary engineering practice. It's a global enterprise for many corporations, for many engineers. And this, no way, this is no way even suggested by the slide it is probably one of the most difficult and interesting challenges to the engineering profession today. How to work within a global infrastructure trying to meet the needs of a global marketplace. Here we begin to see how engineering, process as well as goals, is distinctly different. We shall see that it matters that engineering tasks generally involve the collaboration of a group of individuals. The comparison in the diagram with science is useful if we broaden our scope to include other characteristics 
We have already noted differences in objectives. Scientists seek the truth, engineers make things that work. Scientists ask to question nature. They seek a true answer, one that others can verify. That's why they communicate their results, so others can verify. I put aside whether this really describes the process by which scientists engage or whether scientists really discover final truths. Uh, Kuhn raised that question in his book, The Structure of Scientific Re Revolutions, challenged that notion. Whether it's too simplistic a notion or not, it's commonly accepted that that's what scientists do. Engineers, on the other hand, do not seek truth, but to make things. Here's my, uh, my attempt at a comparison in terms of other characteristics. They make things that, they, they, they do things, they, their objective is to make, make it work. A colleague at the Danish Technical University calls this the pragmatic inter, imperative. This is what motivates the engineer. And indeed, if in her designing, she seems to violate the dictates of some scientific theory held true, and she gets away with it, truth be damned. If it works, that is truth enough. Better still if it makes a profit. Here's one reason why the notion that engineering is applied science, quote, fails. Engineers take considerable liberty with the apparent dictates of science. They're continually challenging as much as working in accord with the strictures of theory, not as falsifying experiments, but in challenging assumptions, presumptions, ideal conditions of the laboratory. The world of the marketplace is quite different from the context of the laboratory. This is another important distinction. Engineers' are, productions are meant for the marketplace. A scientist's productions are intended for a very limited and specialized audience of peers. The engineer's audience is far from elite or specialized. Indeed, some engineers think of their audience as idiots and strive to make their products idiot-proof. <laughs> I note that the social organization of scientists is closed relative to that of engineering cultures. This relates to the characteristic difference in audience and the nature of the products. Engineers, on the other hand, have to keep an open mind, open to the world. Legitimate participation, participants in design and product development include marketing representatives, corporate lawyers, even the customers, the users of their products, despite how often these non-engineers are made the butt of a joke. Legitimate participants in a scientific enterprise are more alike, but note they may very well include engineers. The scientist products takes the form of texts, data, theory, Sometimes instruments, true, but mainly texts with data and logic within a very specialized narrative. The engineer's productions can be text, software program, documentation of a product, but these are ordinarily but one, of a bit of a, one bit of a more complex system. Overwhelmingly, the output of the engineering design process is a toothbrush, a nuclear device, a robotic vacuum cleaner, an SUV, stuff stuff that it works in accord with the engineer's design, and supposedly our needs. Scientific truths are meant to last a long time. I mean, well, after all, if we discover nature's law, they can't change, right? If you don't believe this, you're labeled a relativist and not truly considered a serious scientist. Engineers, on the other hand, are relativists, cultural relativists. They're, they design products, and they know that they, they, they may work, may sell, but only for three, maybe five years, depending upon the attention given to the possibility of maintenance and the pace of innovation in the industrial sector. Finally, I claim that knowledge base of scientists is more narrowly constrained when compared with that applied in engineering design. I'll say more about this in a moment. I'm going to focus on what engineers do as engineers. I want now to go inside the firm and see what engineers actually do. How do they manage to get things to work, to go from ideas, concepts, creative ideas, to some hardware, to some actually functioning product? What's that process really like? Well, I'm not quite there yet. I'm going to start show you another diagram, which is as deficient as the, the one by Sieber, a Snyder. But this one is authored by, a, is found in an engineering textbook, and it shows the design process as a block, in this block diagram. 
I compare it with what Snyder had to say. They're very similar. The block diagram literally frames the engineering design, as does Snyder, as a sequence of steps done sequentially as one travels down the diagram. The possibility of breaking out of the sequence is allowed at the evaluation step. You see those arrows that go out to the side, up and back to generate possible solutions. This is, called, this is why design is called an iterative process. Designing is defined, in this uh, block diagram, is seen as a problem. Engineers see most of the world, within a particular world, as a problem. There's analysis, synthesis, evaluation, decision, action. It all seems so automatic. But the main deficiency with this block diagram, as with Snyder, is that who acts at each of the steps is not specified. It might be a single individual, or a different individual might be engaged at each step, or a team of two or three, or again, 500 might be changed, charged with carrying the ball from top to bottom. The block diagram reflects the engineering urge to abstract, to make general, a complex social process within some kind of al almost algorithm. Indeed. One can interpret the diagram as showing the workings of a problem-solving machine, a device which once fed in the causes, requirements, constraints, and set in motion, cranks away synthesizing, evaluating, deciding, and finally delivering a solution for action. In this light, the diagram shows a timeless, universally applicable computer algorithm. This won't do. For the design and development of new products and systems generally requires the coordination of a team or a group of individuals from different specialties who work on di different features of the system. These participants, these different individuals, inhabit their own individual world of professional practice. A world situated with respect to a particular infrastructure, with its own unique instruments, reference texts, prototypical bits of hardware, special tools, suppliers' catalogs, codes, and regulations. A structural engineer inhabits a different world from the electronics engineer working on the same project. And of course, they're not the only kinds of engineers that will work on a design project. And then there are the marketing people as well who have their own world. These worlds have specialized computer algorithms, specialized ways of picturing states and processes. They have their own language, you could say. I say that different participants work within different object worlds. One object, different views. This is perhaps becomes clear by showing in this slide. This is sort of a classic picture. One object, that's my title, One Object, Different Object Worlds. Uh, but this is a picture of aircraft design. And it's, dream, it's titled Dream Airplanes, but it makes my point that here's one object, the airplane, and here are these different participants in design who are concerned with different things, the structures, the aerodynamics, the power plant, control scheme, and the fuselage. The figure shows how in the design of an aircraft, different participants will see the object of design differently according to their different interests and responsibilities. While this is a cartoon, and ought not to be taken literally, the figure rings true. It's a richer representation, a truer representation of engineering design process, better than Snyder's slide or the design textbook's diagram. Within these object worlds, no matter what sort of engineering it concerns, instrument, instrumental rationality reigns supreme. This is where the science gets applied. These worlds, it's, these, it's for these worlds that engineering schools prepare their students. Problem solving is what engineers do within object worlds. They make abstractions of stuff in the real world, real world, reducing appearances, nay, better put it, seeing through appearances to reveal the operating principles that explain how things work. The structural engineer, though, looks at the aircraft, focuses on the wings, and these appear as cantilever beams with a load varying along their length. That's how they work. And he has a method for determining how to make that structure so that it will support that load. The engine people look at the gross weight of the aircraft, the desired range, and other parameters, and optimize their turbine design accordingly. Same object, different object worlds. The aerodynamicists see the flow field around the craft and attempts to minimize drag relative to lift. 
She does computer modeling too, but it's different from that of the structural engineer who's con very much concerned with that wing profile too because they're putting the structure there. It's a different world. Controls people live in yet another world. These different views have to be reconciled. You obviously can't make an airplane by superimposing these. There's no, uh, and there's no algorithm, this is important, there's no instrumental method, there's no computational algorithm for optimizing, for, though some people try to generate such, for doing this, for harmonizing these different perspectives and, and uh, proposals without these people coming together and negotiating their differences. And that's what makes design a social process. And that's the real complexity of it. Now, I want to uh, dig a little deeper into a um, particular object world, one that I'm most familiar with, that is structural engineering. So I'm going to now flip the tables a little bit. Instead of one object in different object worlds, I'm going to show you two objects with the same object world. Here is a railroad station that's, uh, I think, still under construction, actually, in Stuttgart. And um, I'm, concern I'm concerned with the design of this structure, uh, particularly that roof structure. On the right is a uh, package for a detergent, soap detergent, uh, at Unilever. That, too, is a structure. They're quite different, quite different in scale quite different in purpose, quite different in market, quite different in user. But within the object world structural engineering, they look a lot alike. Here, for example, is a finite element analysis of that uh, dispenser. The shaded plot displays the main buckling failure in the shoulder position, which was then modified to improve the strength prior to tooling. I'll quote from the uh, person who related this, uh, who told me this story. We look at how a thing collapsed when they are in the warehouse, stacked up. We found, for instance, on this one, by changing the contours at the back, we improved the top load strength of the body by 40% and reduced the amount of polymer we needed in the bottle. So we made a cost saving, which made it all better. Okay, I mean, this is real tight instrumental thinking, computer program, numbers, quantitative, and some real hard results and implications for the tooling and for the production of the thing. This shows the mesh and the results of a finite element analysis of that roof structure. The roof structure is loaded primarily by its own weight, it's concrete. And this shows contours of constant stress. And just, you know, we're, we're looking at the same sort of thing. This, in fact, they may have used the very same computer program. The point I want to make is that the two, working on such different structures, make use of the same concepts and principles of engineering analysis. This is an example of problem solving within the object world of structured design, with two different objects. But what engineers do includes more than problem solving within object world. And if that were all, then labeling, labeling of engineers as nerds would be justified. Not so for the engineering life world provides a much richer experience once one acknowledges the social action that is part and parcel of designing. For a structural engineer's well-designed roof structure will conflict with the architect's vision of a roof form. It actually did on that project. The structural engineer's fix of the container geometry to ensure the structure will not buckle in the warehouse may conflict with the materials forming process that seemed to go more smoothly. Solving problems within object world is hard work, as any student of engineering will tell you. But the real complexity of today's engineering tasks derives from the fact that each participant with different competencies and responsibilities sees the object of design differently. This kind of complexity is of a kind different from that which might yield to a comp computational algorithm. Designing requires the collaboration of these different participants and the harmonization of their interests. For engineers collaborating on a design project of all but the simplest kind, working in different domains and different features or subsystems, the creations, findings, and claims and proposals of one individual will be at variance with those of another. Returning to our cartoon of aircraft design, 
The problem is that the optimum aerodynamic shape design will not harmonize with the optimum structural design. People have to move away from their optimum. Or the optimum turbine design or the optimum controls design. A structural engineer cannot specify the structure of an airplane's wing spars independent of the aeronautical engineer's specification of the shape of the wing's profile. So while engineers on a project share a common goal at some level, let's get the airplane flying. At another level, their interests will conflict. And as a result, negotiations, and these are commonly called trade-offs, are required to bring their efforts into coherence. And this, in turn, makes designing a social process. So we see that while object world work is absolutely necessary, it's not sufficient for engineering work to be successful. Negotiation in something other than purely instrumental terms is required. So engineers have to learn to articulate their object world instrumental results so that others who inhabit other worlds can establish meaning with respect to their own perspective. Engineers live in two worlds then, we can say. Within object worlds, where instrumental rationality carries the day, but then they have to operate also within the more open and common, ordinary world of exchange and negotiation, where we might say communicative rationality is the order of the day. But within object worlds, these specialized domains, instrumental rationality reigns supreme. And, these, and this sets certain norms and beliefs, values. The bottom line is this. Within design, there are alternatives and decisions about alternatives that are not based upon instrumental evaluation alone. Our techno environment could be quite different. Most engineers recognize this in their work, and sometimes it comes up sharply in their work. The public generally is unaware. A, a brief word about beliefs. Within these object worlds, the way engineers work is in accord with certain norms, thoroughly materialistic. There are causes and there are determined effects. There are conservation principles and a hierarchy of knowledge. There are mathematical models that produce quantitative results given the appropriate structure and quantitative input. There are instruments and there are test programs and these too produce quantitative results. There is power in science, in the science-based instrumental object world analysis and problem solving. It enables engineers to design, develop, build, and manufacture all manner of sophisticated and simple, minute and micro products and systems. The reduction of everything under their view to material form, physical principles, cause and effect, fully deterministic, everything accountable, it works. It works within object worlds. Now, this is not to say, because the design has this Object world analysis doesn't fix the design, and values enter. It means that there's plenty of room for, f not fair so much, but a product that doesn't work quite as well, doesn't sell, doesn't meet people's objectives. And not, note that not every, not every use, every consequence of technology can be foreseen, taken into account. But engineers try. If your product is to be declared safe, you have to make sure that you've tried to sort out how it possibly might be misused or be unsafe to use. There's one product feature, however, that re re resists the materialist vision. And, and I think this is, again, another factor that differentiates the product of engineers from scientists. In contrast to the scientist laboratory experiment, the engineer must try to take into account the human user, the customer, how to fit the user into the design, how to measure, what to measure, how to, how to account for the client, the customer. Let's move on to that. There are different ways the designing engineer sees the user of her production. I've generated this list. Don't take this as definitive or, or comprehensive. It's an attempt to show you the different ways engineers may think of a user. My list goes from the top, from a kind of Stone Age idealization or model of the human to, to a more enlightened view of today. 
The user can be an idiot, an antagonist or outlaw, can be considered as machinery or its extension, as a statistic, a mean or a variance, and a variance, as a customer with limited money to spend, as themselves, as a legitimate participant in design. And I'm going to say something about most of these. The first label is generally heard in the design of products for the open marketplace, for ordinary stiffs like you and me who have difficulty interfacing with the product, difficulty in getting all the pieces together and assembling it. There's always one left over. Difficulty in deciphering the buttons on the controller. Difficulty in replacing the bag, whatever. Or the user is an idiot if they attempt to use the product in idiotic ways. The classical example is the person who tried to trim the hedge with the rotary lawnmower. I'm not sure. That, I think that's just a myth. To make it idiot-proof, you design with simplicity uppermost in mind. You try to design so that assembly operations are sequential and clear, and you keep parts to a minimum and standard. And you try to foresee all the ways in which the product might be misused and design in guards against such use. In effect, idiot-proof design erects a wall between the user and the workings of the product. The problem with this is that if something goes wrong, the user has little opportunity or encouragement to try to make it go right again. And I hold that idiot-proof design is, is wrong in a way. It's not the right way to design. We can do better, and I think we are doing better. Consider the user as outlaw. I have a story. This is uh, one of the firms that I studied in my book, Designing Engineer. In the course of a field study of an engineering design project, I attended a meeting in which participants in the task set out to draft a test plan to demonstrate the worth of the product. It was a baggage inspection system. The machinery was of room size and included an X-ray source. It's on the left. A column of receptors. That's on the right, the sort of the, uh, framed things on the right of the bay. Separated by a track upon which the air cargo containers rode. The system was meant to detect objectionable content, in particular explosives. Now, I, I want you to know this is well before 9-11. It's well be At the time of the meeting, this is in the late 80s, actually in the 80s, early 80s. At the time of the meeting, the capabilities of the system were known. They pretty much had it all designed. The design was near frozen. That means you really don't, can't go back and change things. The intent of the test plan and the test itself was to prove to the world and customers that the system could indeed identify deadly contraband and do so efficiently without causing excessive delays in the baggage handling process. The initial statement of product specifications simply stated that the system must be able to detect an explosive. But this proved too ambiguous. In particular, what was an explosive? It's the, one of those problems of translating words into things that relate to the hardware more directly. So there's this meaning, meeting to set up this test plan, and the question of what was an explosive came to dominate. So the participants turned to casting of scenarios. They imagined possible situations with individuals bent on destruction by the most devious means. They took on the role of terrorist, described their favorite explosive, its ingredients, hardware components, likely sizes, shapes, and explains how they might smuggle their deadly cargo on board. It was really a dramatic meeting. I was enjoying every minute. I had to restrain myself. After an hour of this most engaging exchange, the group decided, harmonizing their interest, that an explosive was, quotes, a device with wires. Wires are much easier to detect than a bag of powder. Uh, just aside, this shows you the flexibility in specifications. Some people argue, engineers in particular will argue, that given specifications, engineers are given the specifications that meet human needs or something, and then they go about creating and, and crafting something to meet those hard specifications. Specifications aren't that hard. Specifications have to be interpreted. They're like law. 
If they were that hard, there would be no design, because design is of something new. And so if you, you don't really know where you're going in design. So specifications of a certain interpretive, they have to be interpreted. Now, creativity, a good bit of creativity in my mind, is a political problem. Why do I say that? It's because some plus the specifications, if you're, if you're being creative, you have to know which specifications are sacred and which specifications can be challenged. There's no creativity without constraints, or specifications. But you have to know which ones you can get around, challenge, ignore. And this is all done in design. Now, this kind of user, I'm, I'm thinking of the terrorist, the outlaw, as a kind of user. It sounds a bit strange, doesn't it? That you design for a terrorist. Well, in effect, they are. They're trying to figure out how the terrorist might use this product. Designers of network software applications do the same thing, which, which are intended to securely transmit data to and from, spend much of their time and energy trying to figure out all the ways in which the integrity of their systems might be compromised. The opportunities, however, for engaging an antagonistic user or an, outlied, an outlaw in the actual design process of software of this nature, they're much better. And there are plenty of students of computer science who would gladly take on the task of trying to break it. Another sort of antagonistic user is a more ordinary complexion, like me. When I'm in a bad mood, and the damn thing won't do what it should, a not-so-gentle nudge is often my first reaction. Now, designers must consider this. So far, these users are what I call free users. Users who are not restricted or controlled in any way in their use of the product or systems. Others are what I call captive. And a captive user you can consider as, in some cases, part of the machinery that you're designing. An airline pilot, in a way, is a captive user. He's not free to do anything with that airplane. She, she, or she to do. But, A captive user, well, let's go back to the baggage inspection system. The terrorist was not the only user designers sought to accommodate. Well after the design had been frozen and the first tests had been run, a candidate con console operator was asked to operate from the, the, the client firm, was asked to operate the prototype in a lifelike context. Designers observed how the operator struggled to master the various controls and functions available for image processing. Contrast stretching, zoom, edge detection. It's like what you see them doing when you put your bag on the, on the machine at the airport. They noted his missteps. To the software designer on the project, observing the novice's efforts at the control was frustrating. I mean, this was, this was the, the person that designed the software was thoroughly familiar with what those knobs and buttons did. It seemed to him that the operator was blind in one eye and thoughtless too. He showed little appreciation for the power of the alarm algorithmic capabilities of this image processing software. The software engineer wondered if the operator could ever learn to operate the machine effectively. They would have to train the operators carefully, and they had the authority to do so. A captive user. It's hard to say which user, terrorist or operator, was the most difficult to accommodate in the design. Both one imagined the other real showed lacuna in their behavior. The terrorists presented too many unknowns, while the console operator's interaction with the machine were not up to the expectations of the designers, and they wondered what it would take to ensure that they would be after training. One domain where it is important to account for the use of the captive type is in manufacturing, especially when the designing of machinery for production, where the efforts of several workers, users, must be synchronized and the machinery operated in accord with the script so that the work flows smoothly. I'm going to turn to an excerpt from a textbook by a manufacturing ergonomist. They help design workplaces. In particular, an ergonomist is responsible for laying out how the human operator best manipulate, manage, operate the machinery of production. And I have this quote. Manufacturing, this is from the textbook, meant for engineering students. Manufacturing and manufacturing ergonomics have the purposes of quality, productivity, safety, health, and motivation. The productivity objective 
may be achieved by the application of lean manufacturing principles that reduce non-value added activity, such as walking, and by applying work measurement principles to the design of tasks, walking. The safety purpose of manufacturing ergonomics is the avoidance of acute, acute incidents, slips, falls, or wrong decisions that may cause injuries to the human operators or damage to the hardware system or products. Well, here's, here's an, here is an example, I think, of that instrumental app attitude, that materialist attitude being expressed in attempting to design for a user, in this case a captive user, a machinery. The, the user, the human here, is just an element in a productive system. So if you can eliminate their walking, chewing gum, I imagine, talking, having a cup of coffee, you know, you can increase their productivity. Note also, though, the equivalence, how the human is sort of put on the same, in the same category as the machine. Safety may cause, you know, if you violate safety code, may cause injuries to the human operator or damage to the hardware system or products. The author also goes on to point out that human variability is the Achilles heel of their subject. If everyone was alike, you could design easily. But since people don't have the same reach, same weight, same intelligence, maybe. Um, it, it makes their life very difficult. So there again, they treat the human becomes a statistical measure, a mean, a variance, measure of an aggregate. There's no one really there. I'm going to continue the excerpt. Cons Consideration of these five purposes of ergonomics in manufacturing indicates that ergonomics may be applied simply to the maximization or minimization of any one purpose. Ergonomics is neutral. That's very scientific speak. There are clear trade-offs. That's engineering speak. Greater demands for productivity may result in lowered quality and safety may result in lower productivity. These trade-offs, per se, are not the province of the ergonomist but rather of their employers. The ergonomist has the responsibility to measure, analyze, articulate, and evaluate the trade-offs and explore ways of optimizing my emphasis. The multiple outcomes are maximizing a particular outcome if that is the purpose of his or her activity. In other words, the ergonomist is just a tool in themselves. You know. They just have to sort out in the instrumental fashion within this object world what's possible, evaluate alternatives in a very neutral, unbiased way, scientific way, quantify everything, but then pass it along to someone else to make a decision. Note the claim of neutrality. Well, what's wrong with this? In this kind of neutral stance vis-a-vis -vis the individual, who the ergonomist has probably never met or seen as a person of flesh and blood, isn't this attitude to be respected? Isn't it in some ways less denigrating, more equitable? Ethnicity doesn't enter. Isn't this more scientific? A little side note, if you go back to the work of Frederick Taylor in the early part of the uh, last century, who was acclaimed as the father of uh, this kind of uh, work, he actually, I think, would be appalled at this because he saw a, a no uh, trade-off. He saw that the worker could benefit from increased productivity. I mean, not by getting, you know, not by more jobs elsewhere, but the worker in that particular job could profit, could earn more by doing the job more efficiently, um, especially if you're paid with piecework. You can see how that would work. Where are we? So what's wrong with this? Isn't it scientific? What's the alternative? Is not this perspective that the human, op human operator is an extension of or complement to the machine necessary to adopt in order to ensure the smooth operation of the manufacturing process? Well, fine, 
but let's look at where you're drawing the boundaries, perhaps. This particular excerpt, and most of the text is about individuals in their relation to the machine. You go into a work process, it's not just one individual, one machine, it's usually several individuals, many machines, plus now we have a lot of robots, too. So you begin to think, well, maybe if you drew the context a little broader, maybe you could start thinking about uh, these people working together, as some firms, you know, there's some classic examples of that. I guess Volvo was one of them. Context is all important in engineering, where you draw the boundaries around your so-called problem within your object world. This all makes a difference. Where you draw those boundaries is defined by the way you see the world, the way you see uh, machines and operators. These are not dictated by the textbook. These come out of the value systems, the ways of thinking of engineers. Back to the free user. I've noted in contrasting the characteristics of uh, how engineering productions generally have a limited lifetime. In part, this is due to the appearance on the market of ever new and improved products that threaten to put you out of business. So th there's no sense in designing a product to last for ages, as the scientists trust they are doing. Indeed, the dangers of trying to achieve that sort of perfection were well illustrated by Alec Guinness in this movie, The Man in the White Suit. I won't ask how many have seen that movie. Guinness, uh, Alec Guinness is a scientist, I'm quoting from Wikipedia, encyclopedia here, which I understand is a local product. It's good. Guinness is a scientist working in a textile mill who invents a yarn which both repels dirt and never wears out. He has a suit made out of the fabric, which is a brilliant white because it cannot be dyed and is slightly luminous. He is lauded as a genius until both the management and the unions realize the consequence of his invention. The management try to trick him into signing away the rights to his yarn, but he refuses. He's then kept prisoner, but escapes to seek help from the union. But he's surprised to find they too turn on him. So the climax of the film sees Guinness, and this is near the climax, pursued by both managers and employers. Near the end of the film, it begins to rain, and the suit gets wet. And as the crowd, threatening crowd advances toward him, his suit begins breaking apart, apparently from the effects of the rain. The mob, realizing that his yarn has a flaw, rips pieces of the suit off him in triumph, and he's left standing in his underwear. I have one of these new shirts that you don't have to iron. And we purchased, my wife and I purchased, two of these shirts, and I think at different places. Amazing, but the cuffs are falling apart at about the same time, and it's, it's, it's only been three months. Built-in obsolescence was the phrase we used in designing for the user with limited resources to spend on any one trip to the mall. The last user on my list is the user as participant in design. I claim that this way of taking the user into account by inviting them to participate in the process is a more recent development, a development that gives me hope for the future. In part, this is due to the uh, growth and explosive growth in information technology. It provokes new attitudes towards the user. Here are some symptoms. Think of the, power, the, the ability to customize a product according to individual interests. You no longer have to buy, uh, you, know, you, could, you know, long ago, I mean, what, the Ford Model A, Model T only came in black. Well, now we can get a Ford, how many different varieties? This is due in large part uh, with the ability to manage and tune inventory of parts. And this, of course, is due to information technology in part. The other notion I think that's falling by the wayside is let the buyer beware. In part, that's due to uh, uh, you know, lawsuits and things like this. But it's also, I think, uh, because of the uh, growth of information technology and the feedback from the customer and things like this, the ability for that. Indeed, firms and corporations are taking more responsibility for the products, uh, the performance of their products in use. And I'll give you two examples. Just returned from Denmark. And Danfoss is a, is a uh, firm, well-known firm, small firm in Denmark. And they make, well, let's put it this way. They used to make their traditional line with valves 
for uh, refrigeration units and heating units. And this particular, they make a supermarket refrigeration units, and they formally just made the valves for these refrigeration units. And the valve is a very important part of the unit. But now with information technology, they've gone into the electronics and the controls. So now their product is not just the refrigeration unit that's sold to the customer, the store, plunked down, and here's how to turn the valve on and off. But now they sell them an information uh, system, processing system, a data logging system, which measures the energy use, time of day, and all of these things. And all, that information is not only available to the customer, but it's also uh, logged back at Danfoss. And they take a look at that. And they look at whether their machinery, whether that unit is behaving in the best way possible. So with the, with the user out there in the store and this data collection system, they're able to fine tune that system and to maintain that tuning to give them the, a real energy efficient uh, unit. The same thing can happen in your home. And maybe it already is with some of you. But again, from my perspective, it shows a different attitude to the user. And we have Dan Foss taking responsibility for the product in the field. The second example is from Rolls-Royce, maker of engines for jet aircraft. Rolls-Royce, you you, I've heard say, is not selling engines any, outright as such anymore. What they sell now is hours of engine thrust. So in a way, they're, they're still responsible. They, they, the the, the uh, aircraft company buys the engines or takes charge of the engines, but the, the return to Rolls-Royce is dependent upon hours of engine thrust. And so they're continually in touch with the performance of their engine. The relationship with the user changed the way designers relate to users. Think of the open source movement. Software designers release the product in the open source with the expectation that others downstream will make it better, add features, extend its proper uh, product capabilities. Some of the software development with user participation goes on behind the scenes. You don't see what Google is doing. Sometimes they ask for feedback, right? The way the search engine takes account of users' preferences is continually reshaping criteria for the search. Perhaps one of the most important ways in which um, attention to the user and participation of the user in design, that's occurred in the design of uh, computer interfaces, where uh, firms have actually called on anthropologists and ethnographers to go in and observe. Xerox Park was a leader in this, to observe how users use that uh, information interface. So the design is not driven by the software designer's uh, thoughts about what's a neat program, but it's what, what can the user accommodate? How can the user contribute to the design? All of this fits with the emphasis that you hear about sustainable design. Now, I don't know what the source of that phrase is, but we certainly hear it among my engineering colleagues, and it's a very interesting idea. It follows on in the heels, of course, of design for the environment, industrial ecology, notions like that. But that too, the notion of sustainable design, implies that you're thinking further than just caveat and let the buyer beware. You're thinking about what's, what's, what's my product in the world in the future, in this broader context. In short, the user is becoming respectable and the engineer must listen. So I'm optimistic the extent that I see engineers, designers becoming more sensitive to the users, no longer treated as an idiot, no longer just a statistic, no more just an appendage of the machine, nor a customer to be exploited. But my optimism goes only so far. I mentioned that engineering dis decision making is not within a firm, is not all there is to what gives us the technology we deserve. I'm sorry, the technology technology we get. But my optimism only goes so far. Well, I hope I have convinced you that in engineering design, the opportunities for variety and change is unbounded. 
that values and belief play as much a role as instrumental reasoning and hard science in fixing the form of the products and systems that constitute our techno environment. I also, at the outset, made clear that what goes on the war within the firm is not fully decisive. Culture in the large matters. Culture in the large includes government intervention in the rough and tumble world of mergers and acquisitions, attitudes towards free markets and subsidies, standard setting, gas mileage, and legislation of safety requirements, policy setting with respect to environmental conditions. All of these certainly have a fairly direct effect upon not just the regulations in the book that the engineers must abide by, but their thinking, reshaping their values. These are all issues that impact on engineering practice on the choices that designers make. So what can the ordinary citizen do? Well, I think that understanding that design has this uh, potentiality for different forms, for different things to emerge, that you make the ordinary citizen might be a bit more aggressive and, and also in, in think about this diversity when they encounter these other issues that they're more likely to encounter on a committee, local, or in the voting booth on a national issue. So I would hope that our better understanding of what actually goes on in the design and development of products and systems would allow, if not provoke, involvement of citizenry, more citizenry in the design process, maybe directly, but certainly indirectly, through the means available. I think it's a citizen's responsibility, just as one should engage in the political process, to be actively concerned with the process of design and production, not solely as an economic agent or passive user, but as someone who's more active as user. Thank you. There are three microphones that they go to. So tell, go ahead and say it. There are three microphones you can go to. Yeah, right here. And if anybody's leaving now, please be quiet. See, anybody that has to leave now, please do it quietly, silently, without talking. Thank you. For those who want to listen to the questions. So yeah. the questions, you also have question cards. And if you want to fill those out, the ushers will bring those up and we'll go through some of those. First question over here. Go. Thank you for your discussion of... Uh, the importance of bringing normative concerns into technology. I know it's a very difficult topic for people to understand the importance of. We often ask, why can't this all be in much simpler language? I'm seeing in what you're saying a lot from Jürgen Habermas, a philosopher who's hard to explain, and I see you trying to f uh, fill this out in an applied setting. And people will ask, but why? Why are you spending all this time trying to explain this? And well, I've had the same yeah, I, I, can I answer that? Oh, sure. I could make up answers for you, but no, no. Do. <laughs> let me let me make up my own. Yeah. Uh, why why am I concerned with this stuff? Well, I'm, I'm I teach engineering, and I, I don't think uh, it goes. It's quite right. I think that uh, in engineering we stress too much the instrumental, that it's too narrow, that it doesn't uh, reveal all that there is to engineering practice, what it takes to be fully professional. The reaction is usually to say well, our engineers now need to communicate better, so go over there and take a writing course. Or they have to be ethical, so go over there and take a philosophy course. Or they have to be team members, so they go over there and take a management course. Don't touch what we're doing, because we're teaching the hard stuff. And so I write to challenge that. Teaching in urban planning to professional planning students, I have the same issue. There are engineering and scientific bases for decision making that many have a lot of confidence in, and I do as well. Mm -hmm. But when we start talking about questions of ethical choices and who do you count when you're deciding what's ethical, we don't have a scientific basis for that. And yet we've devalued those who have 
approaches that are rigorous, that are intellectually challenging, that are uh, clear, yeah. and that can address very, very difficult issues, and yet we put that aside. And I'm, I'm fairly confident that that's where the nexus of our next opportunity is. We must find ways of describing in ways that people can have as much confidence in as they now do in science. Yeah, I'm trying. Because right now we're losing the confidence in science. And so where, where are people looking? I think there is some, uh, we don't have the quite so romantic notions about uh, the general populace about uh, the ability of science to solve all of our problems, except perhaps for, what's his name, Kurzweil, who wants to make us live forever. Um, but um, can you hear me? That was a joke. Okay. I'm sorry. All right, I'll use this mic. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think there's less of uh, that romantic notions about science. Where, and I think you're right that uh, we need to be able to somehow um, respect what is not given by a quantity measure. That means in economics, too, as well. And your citation of Habermas, uh, you know, I'm not quite up to speed on him. But I think there, there is, he argues for a different, you know, there's instrumental rationality and there's communicative rationality, which, yeah, that's, that's one of the directions I'm headed. But again, the purpose is, I think, our engineering education is deficient in this respect. In your lecture, you mentioned both the challenge of global engineering and working with engineering at a scale, like, unprecedented and you know, working in engineering around the world, you also yeah. mentioned Google, which has a considerably different, uh, considerably different way of dealing in small groups. From your insights and in studying engineering firms, what can you tell us about your insights in where a group is efficient as a small yeah. group, where it starts to break down and starts yeah. to sink under its own weight from being so large? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. The one experience I do have, I think, is in teaching, where we try to Sometimes um, we have student groups, of course, and doing projects, particularly in a capstone design course. It's not all science and engineering curriculum, but we do have usually a capstone design course. Now, I think the groups I think that work best are on the order of five students, three to five, maybe six, but not much more. And I, I don't know whether that's true in industry. The groups I've seen, I mean, there's usually a core group, and then there's maybe hundreds of others, including suppliers out there that are legitimate participants in design. But there's usually a core group, and I don't think that core group should get above five or six. I don't know. That's just off the top of my head. Next question. I, uh, I was kind of wondering, you were talking about trade-offs and how it's rather interesting that you, if you give so much energy into user, you might not have as much function, or if you give so much into artistic design, you might not, it might not be effective for a user. Mm -hmm. But it's also like, if you can be more creative to raise the standard of both, then that would be more, yeah. more admiral or whatever. Um, who or what would sort of judge these standards of creativity and effectiveness in all fields of the product. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I mean, I, the trade-off. The trade-off is, is, is really a c constructive term in my mind. We speak of it all the time in engineering, as, and it's, it's, trade-off implies, and I think means, a binary deci a decision between two things. But as you pointed out, it's not just two things, and as I've pointed out, uh, there are more than two, generally two, things that are involved in, in, in uh, two, two sorts of things that you have to consider, more than two. And yet, engineers, well, it's easier to make a decision between two and things, it's either one or the other, right? Where if you have three, you're in a problem. So then you have to set priorities, and there's a famous theorem by Kenneth Arrow that says when you get um, more than two things, and you try to set priorities among uh, different people, you can't, have, you don't have a rational way for establishing an overall priority among options. All right? So there's a relationship between that very theoretical idea of Kenneth, Kenneth Errol, of how you really can't equitably uh, set priorities among different things with people having different priority lists. Um, and I think then you have to move away from that kind of instrumental thinking about trade off. And, and yes, try to raise 
you know, what is it, the level of all boats or something. And I think you can do it. Uh, and that's, I mean, and it takes a creative act, yeah. A way of thinking that, you know, you have to stop thinking trade-off, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, if you thought, um, in line with your hopes that the user is getting some more input, I would think that an engineering firm, so-called, would want to identify what disciplines are so vital to adding this, you know, beyond the just, uh, you know, bringing in the normative dimension. Where do you get that? Do you get that from psychology, philosophy, art, whatever? And maybe an engineering firm should just say, we're always going to have a ratio of, say, six engineers to three psychologists to one anthropologist or something. It's like, we will never again just be a, quote, engineering firm. We will import these sister disciplines that we are going to identify as vital and bring them into the firm and let them keep their identity. We'll not call them engineers. We'll say, oh, and then we have this psychologist guy and this lady here is... Anyway, that's my question. Why not mix it up a little more and... Um, bring in these other disciplines, actually actively do that? Well, I think some firms do bring in other, uh, uh, particularly, uh, as I say, anthropologists are very active in user interface studies. And psychologists, too. Uh, Norman spoke about um, design, I think. He's a psychologist, and he's you know, used by industry quite a bit. I'm going to plug philosophers. Oh, yeah. yeah. Got to employ more of those, too. Yeah. Um, the one thing I don't, I, I, I don't like this compartmentalization, and maybe it's, again, it reflects my comment about engineering education, how people's solutions just take off there and take that specialty. See, I think the problem is maybe too much reliance upon specialties and not enough upon learning to speak about these other specialties. And, you know, yeah, bring them into the firm and, and, and make things open, but really engage each other. You know, one of the things that uh, happens in engineering education is, is that you get different people maybe collaborating in a course which is interdisciplinary, and it becomes an exercise in team teaching where the, someone goes first and the philosopher goes second, you know, and this doesn't really, this is not really effective. It doesn't really lead to a product. Yeah. Am I right here? Or over there, I guess. Um, we have sort of more of a comment and sort of a question. We wanted to say that we really enjoyed your speech because uh, you have a very nice voice and it was very warm <laughs> and easy to follow. And so we sort of have an elementary school question. We were wondering how long you've been in the field of study and if you had a prior job, was it anything close to uh, reading books on tape? <laughs> Well, I used to be a rock star. <laughs> no, I, I, I thank you very much. And next question? <laughs> hi. Uh, yeah. Hi. A little uncomfortable in this forum. My mother in her mid to late 60s was privileged to participate as a test driver for an electric vehicle called the EV1. In Los Angeles. Yeah. And it was great. Yeah. I happened to be visiting at the time. Uh -huh. They were leased for a short time after that. Then they were all recalled and crushed. <laughs> yeah. I want to know where the values of engineers, the values of consumers, and the values of a society driven by oil companies and huge generators of electricity. I mean, I would purchase photovoltaics enough to charge such a car and use it here around Portland. But it's not available anymore, and the photovoltaics are too expensive. So how do I, as a consumer of some intelligence, not quite the idiot, how do I change the world? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah, how do we change the world? Um, well, I think, first of all, let me comment on that program. I read about that, and I thought that was an interesting program. And it, again, I think, uh, is evidence of this um, interest in getting the user involved. There's always been things like focus groups and I guess uh, practice drivers or whatever. Uh, but I mean, that's, that's, you know, the ending of my talk was rather weak, right? 
You know, I talk about how there's um, design as a social process and there's a lot of room for decision making. You see how flexible things can really be and that engineers' values, people's values, what they think is good, what they think is the right way to do things, who they think should be considered in their design. You know, there's all of this stuff that is uh, not instrumental, it's not quantitative. Once I've said that, so what do I do? How do I make the world better? And I try, I must say, I don't, it's not a very strong thing to say that, well, at least you realize that, you know, and then it, you take it from there. And I think it's mostly in the political process, Let's, but it's, it's not just political, it's in the whole, the, whole, the whole ethos, the way we think about things. I talked to a group of teachers uh, today, twice today, I guess, right, Terry? Yeah. And, uh, oh, I talked to students. That was funny. <laughs> <laughs> students were, they were good. Um, but um, I mentioned this corporate mentality. I think we, um, we have this, in, in education, there's this corporate mentality now. No child left behind is the label, I guess. But, you know, you've got a box there, right? You've got a school with a box, and there's things inside the box, like teachers and students. And then what do you do? Well, you measure what the output of the box is going to be at various stages. And so sort of that's the managerial. Don't open up the box to look at what's inside. You know, don't get your hands dirty with that. Just set the strategy. Leave the tactics for someone else. You know, that's not going to be on any referendum. Well, certainly uh, that issue about how we deal with education is, 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 is uh, on referendum, it's going to be subject to vote. But those, you know, I think it reflects uh, a certain attitude, instrumental attitude, um, that, you know, we should stop and think about and reflect on and talk about maybe. So it, it's not necessarily this direct things we can do. There's a whole cultural value system also, clearly, which incidentally other countries don't share with us. That's obviously a source of problem. Conflict, I should say, problem. Tension. Uh, that's enough of that. Yeah. You talked extensively about evolving uh, attitudes towards end users in the engineering field and how this takes place in a social and historical context and briefly made allusions to uh, products liability yeah. and other legal contexts yeah. shaping the direction of this development. Yeah. And at your conclusion, you stated that you were encouraged by the current status of the user as a participant in design, as opposed to what one might call more 19th century view of the user as merely a cog yeah. or somebody to be bilked. Right. My question is, when you concluded by encouraging users and consumers as citizens to be more aggressive in what they were asking for, uh, you seemed a bit hesitant to make any particular ideological or political illusions, and my question for you is, how would you balance the need for flexibility, uh, in, like under a laissez-faire system, with uh, more regulatory needs concerning yeah. safety and these other questions, and would you actually go and summarize a uh, political or ideological suggestion as to where to go from here, what would be best for engineering and for society in general? Yeah, you know, I think, no, I didn't, as I very similar. Last question away. Sorry. No, that's fine. No, it's a good question. And uh, it's good to, you picked up on things that I said, which is, you know, it's always reassuring. Um, again, I think there's, you know, we can accept the ideology of free market and, uh, and it becomes almost a religious sort of tenet. And I'm not sure that's healthy. And again, look at other countries, what they're doing. Again, this is a source of tension. Look at the way they uh, try to regulate. Take the European Union, where they're a very constructive enterprise, where they've tried to establish common standards. You know, It's not a lazy affair. It's, let's, let's get together. Let's make common standards so we can increase our productivity, increase our trade. Let's have a common currency. You know, this, I mean, that's real government innovation, intervention, right? So an idea that without government, you know, just let free market decide, I think is, I mean, taken as a religious tenet, I think is, is just, you know, that's, that's disastrous ultimately, I think. Right. It's, it's there's, where, where do you set the balance? Well, you have to negotiate that, you have to decide. You know? And, you, you and our situation is different than, than 
the European community, certainly. So you'd suggest there's a need for reevaluating case-by-case basis, industry-by-industry, product-by-product sort of system? Yeah, I think there should be some, uh, I don't know, it may be going on. I mean, maybe there are government agencies that are looking at, say, for what happened to the photovoltaic industry in this country? You know, I had some, did some work with them. Under Carter, we had a demonstration system at Lincoln Laboratory, which is a captive organization of the, of the Air Force, but they could spend 15% of their money on things other than defense. And I worked uh, out there on, uh, on a project that had uh, funding to develop photovoltaic demonstration sites. That was under Carter. Reagan was elected, and that program was cut. And I didn't go out to Lincoln Lab anymore after that. But, um, you know, they're, they're, you want to look at what this is doing. I mean, do we have any photovoltaic manufacturing capability in this country anymore? Uh, SolarX down in New Jersey. They're now, they were brought out by BP. Well, we, we have some little entrepreneurial groups that are doing some interesting things with thin films and ways of manufacturing. But they don't, they don't produce like uh, Kyocera in Japan or uh, Photowatt in Europe or Siemens, British, you know. We don't have that industrial capability anymore. What does that mean? Well, if you buy into it, it doesn't matter in this global world. It doesn't matter. Nation states are, yeah, maybe nation states are irrelevant. Maybe it's no longer going to be nation states. What time is it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. This is the last, last one like this. Yeah, but this is the last comment like this. No longer nation states. Maybe it's going to be, you know, Gazprom and Monsanto, right? that we worry about. We're already worrying about those things, right? Is Gazprom more powerful than Lithuania? I think you'd have to say yes. Any more questions? One up here. One, more up here. One from up here. Yeah. You've spoken about the, uh, the need to consider how values influence the design and engineering process. I'm curious about your perspective on the reverse. How participating in the design and engineering process shapes the values of those people who are doing that and in turn perhaps feeds back into what they produce. And perhaps as an adjunct to that, whether uh, those values are involved in deciding what we produce or whether we do it simply because we can, because it's cool. I think all of the above. Um, I think certainly um, the way engineers work fixes the way they think about things. But I think, I think most engineers recognize that they should only think about those things within their object world work. But of course, it's impossible to not let what consumes you for 80% of your day not affect the way you think about other things. Usually this appears in the form of humor, uh, where uh, you, someone will make an engineer make a joke that's, uh, you know, is based upon object world experience, an in-joke, and it's applied to a more general common experience. But it's a joke. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that engineers are, 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 are clean in that respect, that they don't let, um, yeah, clearly it's going to affect, the, what I do as an engineer is going to affect the way that I think about the world, about my family, whatever, some way. But I don't know. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, engineers are any different than any professional, like plumbers or surgeons. What's the difference, plumbers or surgeons? So, um, or um, lawyers, the way their relationship with their client, you know, a lawyer with his, a defense lawyer with his client has a relationship there. That's uh, not your standard relationship between two people. And, uh, but yet the lawyer, and sometimes it's a struggle to try to distance themselves. And I'm sure a doctor with a patient has that problem, too. So an engineer, too. A little different. And of course, it feeds back into the design. Well, that's, the, that's one of the points I'm trying to make, is that the values do affect the things they design in our future. Last question. We're going to run a little late here, no? Go ahead. Um, there was a man named Buckminster Fuller I was uh, hoping you could um, tell us a little bit about how his view for humanity will, uh, is it, how do you feel about it? How do you, th how do you think? I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not a, 
I haven't read an awful lot of Fuller, Buckmeister Fuller. I just simply can't um, respond to the really that. I, must, I, will, I will say that uh, I think that, uh, I think Kurzweil is a good example maybe that people can get off the deep end in terms of their projections of their scientific understanding out onto the rest of culture. I think engineers generally are less uh, likely to do that. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Answer, answer. You know, it's, it's also, it's not just the iPod, it's not the business that, you know, it's dedicated to mic uh, image, right? Yes, which one just the mic thing. It's my they were finished, they would take it to the local grade school and give it to the kids, and then when they, when the kids had it totally locked up, then it would return to the factory and the engineers would figure it out <laughs> and put in the, the safeguards or the... Yeah. You have to pry any little fingers in it? <laughs> <laughs> Until the kids couldn't lock it up anymore, and then they released it. So they yeah. It seems that that's, a, that's not a bad approach. In, in no, no, you obviously need some, some protector to, to, to guard against misuse and things like that. It's more the attitude, I think, that I object to. Now, I don't know where to draw the line. Of course, it depends upon the product, too. But um, it's more the attitude that the user somehow can't learn. Maybe we ought to design this, so maybe there's something the user can learn about machinery, about my stuff. Maybe I should make the casing a little clear plastic so you can see through something, though it doesn't move too much. But at least the user will see there's something inside that might be aesthetically pleasing. You know, the question the student up in the balcony. Um, no moving parts. Yeah, yeah well, but the question that student in the balcony about how, you know, about trade-offs and how, why not? Why is it just trade-off? Why can't it be creative and bring everything up? And I think that's, that's a good question. Yeah. So uh, I see, say, a class of engineers collectively very inter interested in optimization, getting the most with the least. Yeah. Here we have digital technology, easy to make copies of everything, perfectly faithful to the original devices that could do it in vast amounts. And then we have a legal culture, which is saying, you know, these things have to be kept protected. We can't allow intellectual. To me, it looks like that the engineering ethos and the lawyer legal ethos, <coughs> and to some extent, are highly discordant on a collision course in terms of either we're going to solve things and let people freely distribute whatever because people need them, or we're going to keep tight, tight, tight control and not. And it seems like 
pretty soon in this apocalyptic vision, you're either going to be a lawyer or an engineer on that issue. <laughs> Do you think there's any merit to that worldview? Well, that, that becomes, we're all lawyers or engineers. Well, I don't think that's an no. you're either You're either encouraging engineering, yeah. which would optimize solutions regardless of their legal consequences. Well, I'm not sure that you can optimize in as separate from legal consequences. I think the legal is part of the picture and you have to deal with that as an engineer. Um, so that's one thing I would say. I do think there is that engineers tend to be idealistic and that's a good thing. Uh, the open source movement has Dilbert? really... Hmm? Dilbert? I don't read Dilbert. I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, I, I don't read anything. My wife will tell you I don't read anything. <laughs> uh, maybe a little blog. I like I'm reading a biography of Rousseau now. So. But, um, um, I think that, that there is this tension, particularly in this country, maybe more so than in other countries, you know, this very litigious society here compared to others. Um, but I think, and I think engineers are idealistic, and I, th I think that's good. I think well, MIT, uh, President Chuck Vest, you know, said with Hal Avison from Computer Science, we're going to make, put all our cautions on open courseware. Great, you know, very idealistic. And very much in the spirit of open source, everything, everyone. It, it really is an effort. I mean, I've got three courses up there, and I let everything up there. But there are other faculty, other departments of it. We want to keep things close to our best because you know that's our propriety. So there is that tension certainly, and I think uh, when it, when you're in an innovative stage with technology like we are now, it is possible that uh, it will go. You know, there is that tension. But I think it's also possible that the technology is evolving. That, and be, there's so much innovation that the lawyers won't be able to keep up with it. I think that's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. And that, um, you know, but you never know. I mean, there's nothing foreordained about the development of technology. You know, it's, it's up to us. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not just, an, and, and I don't mean it's up to, there's two, there's this view, evolutionary metaphor is very popular these days. And it has been popular, and, and people, Put the evolution of technology in some kind of evolutionary metaphor. Well, I don't like that one either. I don't like autonomous technology with its inner logic, nor do I like evolutionary metaphor. Because evolutionary metaphor sort of lets you off the hook too. It says it's all random mutations, you know, and then survival of the fittest. So you're just, what are you? You're a generator of random mutations? <laughs> you know, I don't like that. I think we have to take responsibility. I don't know how you do that. Can I, can I suggest one thing? Because somebody was asking me earlier, for one metaphor that was capturing some of the things you were saying, and I think that one we tried earlier, and it wasn't, I don't think it was part of your talk, was, is like um, the telephone thing. Do you want to do that? Do you have that book here? My book? Is I don't. Book? We didn't bring it? I didn't bring it tonight. Can you do it off the top of your head? No, I can't do it. Designing engineers. Oh, come on. You can do it off the top of your I head. I can't do it off the top of my head. <laughs> here, I got a copy. Yeah. Okay. I did? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's signed autograph. Here you go. Yeah, an autograph stuff. Oh, yeah. There you go. This is something we, he went over to uh, Central Catholic High School <coughs> and ran this, and then we also did it up at Portland State, and I think it, it just captures uh, one of the messages and one of the reasons there's uh, Larry and several of the other people from National Academy of Engineering that we brought in about engineering as a, as a social enterprise. And this idea of, you know, like the, energy, the in engineers are over here and they do their thing and then it happens all these consequences. And this metaphor gives you a sense, I think, I don't know, I'll read it. Yeah, I mean, it's just a metaphor, larger. but it's, it's about technological yeah. literacy. Yeah. And it's in the introduction, and it's one of the questions that I raised to, to introduce the idea. My idea is about design and engineering and being complex social process and many different participants in design and the design of something like a telephone, a telephone system. So this is a uh, section, do you know how your telephone works? A few years ago, I attended a national conference on technological literacy, a topic that had recently attracted attention in the media, as well as among scholars concerned with education at both secondary and post-secondary levels in the United States. One of the main, one of the main speakers, a sociologist, presented data he had gathered in the form of responses to a questionnaire. After detailed statistical analysis, he had concluded that we are a nation of technological illiterates. As an example, he noted how few of us, 
less than 20% of its respondents said they knew how their telephone works. The statement brought me up short. I was in the audience. I found my mind drifting and filling with anxiety. Did I know how my telephone works? <laughs> <laughs> I squirmed in my seat, doodled some, and asked myself, what does it mean to know how a telephone works? Does it mean knowing how to dial a local or long distance number? <laughs> Certainly I knew that much, but this did not seem to be the issue here. Might it mean knowing how to install a phone? Or perhaps knowing what to do when something goes wrong, no dial tone, noise on the line. <laughs> but most of us do know what to do. In such cases, we need only call the service department. <laughs> now, I suspected the question must be understood at another level, as probing the respondent's knowledge of what might be called, in quotes, the physics of the device. I called to mind an image of a diaphragm excited by the pressure variations of my speaking. Vibrating and driving a coil back and forth within a magnetic field, generating a variation in voltage across the terminals of the coil. I could even picture the signal traveling along the wire, coming out of the phone into the wall and out onto the pole outside my house. But what then? How do all those different signals from different phones get sorted and routed to their proper destinations? I had no explanation for this. <laughs> if that's what the speaker meant, then he was right. Most of us don't know how our telephone works, and I bet if he asked, most of us don't give a damn about <laughs> <laughs> knowing how it works, as long as it does. Despair and guilt have yielded to cynicism. Indeed, I wonder, does he know how his telephone works? <laughs> does he know about the heuristics used to achieve optimum routing for long distance calls? Does he know about the intricacies of the algorithm used for echo and noise suppression? Does he know how a signal is transmitted and retrieved from a satellite in orbit? Does he know how AT&T, MCI, Quest, and the CIA, oh, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> and the local phone companies are able to use the same network simultaneously? <laughs> Does he know how many operators are needed to keep the system working or whatever, what those repair people actually do when they climb a pole? Does he know about the corporate financing, capital investment strategies, or the role of regulation in the functioning of this expansive and sophisticated? The CEO's role communication system. Does anyone know how their telephone works? How about the designer of the device? Surely he or she must know. I followed this line of thought for a while, but again, I found my footing less sure than I had anticipated. Indeed, from my own observations, and that's going around in these firms, I can, fairly I can claim fairly confidently that there's no single individual alone who knows how all the ingredients that constitute a telephone system work together to keep each of our phones functioning. There is no one maker, no one designer. Instead, inside each firm, there are different interests, per perspectives, responsibilities. Corporate planning, engineering, research, production, marketing, servicing, managing, and consequently, different ways in which the telephone works. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. 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 You would have sold a lot of books if you read that in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 What is that a metaphor for? Uh, well, it's... I mean, I get my commentary if I can. I mean, it, it, there, there are several things. One is that, God, there's a bunch of things you can pull out of this. But th what we are battling in a way is this image of engineering as a strictly, if you like, scientific technical discipline sort of thing. Just tell me what the specs are, and the engineers will go off and do it. And that there's no interplay. And that they, really, and that I guess what we talk about that the whole sense of design, that the design process is. is particularly in the second book, uh, this communication thing, where you have all these different people trying to communicate with each other, trying to figure out how the thing works. Each one's solving a different a complex aspect of the problem. There's no such central person like, well, here's the design. Uh, <coughs> I thought that's where you're going, Terry. There's this thing here that, not, that you didn't say that you really should. The reason these systems work is because somebody initially was able to decompose them into a set of problems that could be solved separately. Yeah, I don't think it happens that way. If you look at it historically, it's central though, to how it happens. No, I don't think so. Absolutely. If you look at it historically, the, the things that have come on over a period of time. I mean, it's like the guys who did, you know, the guys who did the original telephone system did not have any anticipation of cell phones. I mean, is it, all these things have been added on, and the corporation, the finances, and the, the different kinds of switches are working, and this addition of satellites. Those are all additions to the design for a period of time. I look at it. It's not somebody who didn't sit down and break that all down and say it's that. The design broke at an earlier stage then, because what, what was preserved was the function 
system, a modern cell phone has almost nothing in common with an old-fashioned telephone. The sure, diaphragm and the magnetic field, cell phones use um, capacitive sensing on the magnetic field, no coil, nothing like that. Yeah, well, that's the whole point. That's so the, point. the function well, is preserved, not, not the physics. But what's the, the function, phone. though? What is the function, ultimately? The ultimate function is communication. I mean, the function is like, that's where you were getting down to. There's nothing more common. There's nothing that's going to be retained the between. Saying, the decomposition of the problem into separate pieces is the same in the days of cell phones now as it was. Two things. There is a historical process here, you're right, no? and that they, you do indeed try to bring mm -hmm. things down and decompose, and that's, that's a design act in itself. When you decide, you know, where the interfaces are going to be and who's going to be responsible, you know, you've already started designing. And the problem, I would argue, though, and from what I've seen anyway, is that you can't make interfaces so clean that people can work completely independently, and then you just kind of patch it together like a crossword, or like not a crossword puzzle, but like a puzzle, you know, jigsaw puzzle. So I think, uh, indeed, you want to try to decompose, and it's essential, and I think in the early stages, you know, that defines the that defines the thing is the way you know the decomp decomposition process is in itself an act. And it defines what you're going to get out of it. Throw in one more thing. It's the failure of decomposition that drives the process. I saw at Boeing. They, 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 Boeing has a graph that shows how much it costs to make a change at what stage in the process on the way to delivery of the first plane. Mm -hmm. It's a graph that goes up geometrically. With sure. Time. You always and it always represents failures at the crevices between the division. They yeah. They separated a problem and they missed something. It's very That's difficult to also to track the. Uh, the influence of one change in this sy subsystem on another, which seems so isolated and, and apart. There's a, there's a chain, maybe, of, of, of relationships uh, that eventually gives you a change in the, uh, uh, the engine <coughs> cylinder size or something because of something you did with the rear brake light. You know? And you can't... If you accept that a, a major issue of design is this separation into problems and sure. failures, there, sure. uh, wouldn't you have expected that the culture of engineering design that you're talking about grew up to serve that problem? Well, I think in practice it, it does, it tries, and it does very well in serving that problem. I think in the schools we don't do very well in teaching students Could you about use that. that as an organizing principle for your ideas? Now, wait, 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 let me just interject. Let me respond to David first one thing. Because I think that the, what you, the way you responded is exactly the wrong answer. Let me tell you why I think it is. Uh, again, Larry had a great simulation. We all ask him to repeat it. But it's a simulation where you have, uh, what is it? I mean, you have four, four different factors. You have the person who's in charge of the finance. You have the person who's doing the, uh, the thermodynamic side of it. Another person's doing the structural side of it. And what was it? There's was an architect. An architect in there, too. And you, and, and you say, well, how do these four people work together? I mean, they all have four different parts of the problem. And you say, well, we'll decompose it. This completely misses the whole point. The whole point is that this is a social communication thing. Each one of them has flexibility in how they're doing, and all their specifications overlap with each other. The idea that, like, we'll say we're gonna we're gonna just break this down, and we'll come up with the answer. You can't do that. That's not how it works. I don't think he's saying that. that no, but he's talking about decomposing it into separate little the things. These guys work on that. the driver of the process. Everything grew up to serve that process and the failures of it as well. Now, I wouldn't call, call them failures, though. Because I don't think I think there, those problems of interfaces and dealing with them is is the complex part of engineering design. So I, I wouldn't call it a failure because it's always going to be with you. You know, you can you can address those problems in some I'm way. I'm confident with that. I, as soon as you said it was the complex part of engineering design, it's yeah. the labor that really that's the part that really you have to work at. Yeah. Well, the, and it's this exchange. The, and also the idea that there is no right answer and so like that. And they, they, I mean, one other thing, Ron Adams talked about, and I, I was explaining some of the things of his book, because this idea of object languages, and that he was saying, this is the, the dean of engineering at Oregon State, and he says, oh yeah, and he says, when I was at Tektronix, this is exactly what was the problem, because <clears throat> the electrical engineers had a certain language, and they had an object world corresponding to that language. They saw a bunch of electric you know, capacitors, inductors, and so forth out there, and that's the, that world worked that way. And the mechanical guys, had their language and their object world and their mathematics and so forth, they had their stuff. And he said the problem was when we tried to do electromechanical device, no one knew how to put them together. And he said the guys who we had to have, there were a few people that had both degrees. Wanderers. No, well, they were, but hopefully they had both degrees and they could communicate. But this idea that the part of what he's been saying is that the design process say, well, we'll break it down. You guys do the electrical part, you guys do the structural part, you guys do it. It doesn't work. 
And the people, and the question is, how do all these people interface? And they all have trade-offs. They can also do. We can make the electrical really, really sophisticated, or no, but it can't be that heavy. But then you. So this, the design process is this whole complex I, I agree. Process. What I'm missing is it seems to be a red letter. Mm -hmm. They deal with doctors, they deal with yeah. electrical people, they're electrical engineers. This, right. So they're very well aware of it. Yeah, they're graduate students. And yeah. They, yeah. But I'm talking about the undergraduates primarily that don't see this. Yeah. Quick question. How do you see as engineering becomes decentralized, is in open source, there yeah. is no one in charge of Linux or any of the... Yeah. There's no one in charge. How does that culture, that set of, that anthropology, yeah. what kind of results does it produce which are different than when you have centralized leadership? What well, you I think, uh, you know, I, I'm not an authority on this, but, you know, I've read some, and they say that with open source you get better, more robust programs because there's more involved, they're, 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 it's, it's really run through the ropes more. Simply by beta tester. Yeah, that's the, I, I guess, now what is I think there's some truth to that. I, don't know. I think it's not just because it's free uh, that it works. So, uh, but that's a whole exciting new thing. I think I, I don't know. Maybe someone can find a historical par uh, parallel. I don't know one. I think information. I generally have stayed away from information technology and computers and writing about technology. I just don't know how to deal. Is with Is there any really. precedent for that style in? Mechanical engineering? Well, there's people have tried try that, you know, uh, to try putting up open source of designs and things like that. I don't think it gets very Everybody far. gets to build one part of the building, you know, we all well, work yeah, Well, you know, a machinery or something. Yeah, there's people that have tried. I've seen a few things like that on the web. I don't think they last for, I, I don't think they have any You know, one, one thing, can I say that one thing that struck me about the telephone model that you got out there, because you all of a sudden you realize there was no, there never has been, I mean, as I rejected David, that there never was, never has been, never could be one person putting that whole thing together. There are way too many factors in it. So you say, well, wait a minute, there's all these different components in the design. How is it that it all works together? Okay. Well, there's a famous metaphor about this. It's called the invisible hand. Okay. It was Adam Smith. And the whole idea of, and some people would say, design's always like that. Yeah, I Any social system that operates, operates, I mean, the socialistic ideal, the central committee that's going to tell everybody what to do. I mean, in some sense, in a corporation, that works on a very, very small scale, but large scales. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's an invisible hand. I think of it more of the, as the visible thing. <laughs> that, I, mean, I mean, that's that's what you have, you know. Yeah, but you've it's got like, the, you've got the thing, and the damn thing works. Yeah, what do you say, and the visible, visible thing, thing, the object, the actual <laughs> artifact, and it works. And by golly, you may not know why it works completely, or someone have a. Yeah. One person will have a vision after it's all done even, and it's right there in front of you. This is why it works, and this is why we made that decision. Another person will say, I did this, I go around a meeting. Why did you choose the, the um, open circuit voltages? It's photovoltaic modules, 48 volts. And you go around and they have this argument. And I was there at the meeting where they decided. One person gives this explanation, another person gives this, and they're different explanations. But, there's, but you got the object, and it works. So, um, you know. You can still have you had conflicting reports, and yet you have c consensus. I think that happens in other things. So, society. Yeah. Non-technical question. Um, can you tell us um, a little bit about the advice you give to students now, going out in the working world? You know, kind of. You know, the kinds of things that you tell them, and maybe how that's changed over the last, say, thirty or maybe even forty years. Uh, I have probably haven't given much advice. I probably I, what I do is I listen to students and say that's great. Who am I to tell them? Yeah, well, yeah. I'm not sure I give. I don't. Know, you know, we have four kids, and I'm not sure I've ever given too much advice. Yeah. And the other question I had is, you know, in your lecture you're talking about scientists versus engineers. Do yeah. you find yourself trying to bridge that gap between? the different fields and trying to get people on the same page in terms of understanding the different language? Well, I, I've done some work in the history of science. I wrote a biography with a woman, with a colleague, uh, Nancy Dorsey, now we have a about a French. I, I wrote a biography of a French woman mathematician, Sophie Germain. So it was, uh, I can't get it. Well, it's, uh, anyway, so I've done work in the history of science. And uh, that, of course, I have an interest in science, but it's primarily, it's not the uh, gee whiz kind of interest in science. It's more, you know, science as an activity, an intellectual activity, and uh, how uh, 
traditional before Kuhn representations of the development of science were not so satisfying, and you know, even before I read Kuhn. And I think uh, so I have an interest in science in that respect, in terms of the historical and the philosophical, and also the sociological with the science study movement now. Um, but I think the the main uh, the, the 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 bridge that I try to make is between the the humanistic and the engineering and the technical, less the science. It's more, um, you know, why should students read literature? Even though I don't, but why should they read some philosophy? Or why should they uh, be sensitive to the kinds of questions anthropologists ask? Why uh, shouldn't they know something about fact value, the value dis dis dichotomy, and the difference between subjective and objective? And uh, be able to distinguish myth from uh, uh, from uh, actual norms that work in practice, say science or, or in engineering. So um, it's more. In, uh, I have a strong interest in the history. I've taught some of the history of technology as well, with colleagues, and uh, and of course the interest in the philosophy, but also in the sociology. So that's the those are the things I. I'm sorry. where they are. <laughs> They're still in school. Well, okay. <coughs> yeah. Well, I think we got to move away from the, the, the idea that knowledge is stuff. All right? Well, you know, knowledge, that, that's uh, at least, that's what you kind of metaphor, there's a metaphor for you, uh, that knowledge is stuff, you know. Going to MIT is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant. You know, there it's a fluid. <laughs> you know, uh, now there's just stuff. But you know, in our curriculum, we have a curriculum discussion. Which textbook book should we use? We've got to cover all of this stuff. You know, and I think. And what do we do? We transmit knowledge to our student. You know, they sit there and lecture, and we're the source. You can see the cartoon, right? And there's stuff spewing out from my mouth, and and they're sucking it in somehow. You know? until they explode full of knowledge. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I, I think, you know, the, at least old past, but they're the features that, they're all sensitive to that. That's not the right metaphor. Knowledge, what is knowledge? I don't know what knowledge is. I know what information is. Information is stuff. But I think what's important is knowing, knowing what you do with information. Wisdom has a place. Oh, wisdom, and that's what happens when you get to be older. <laughs> then, it, then you can say things like, knowledge is, knowledge is not anything. You know, the wisdom is everything. Um, but, okay, so my, that's my, I guess that's my point in, in, in a point. Let's stop thinking about having to cover all of this stuff. Now, there is something, of course, to uh, becoming uh, sensitive to different perspectives. So what's my crude solu solution, I guess? In design, as I say, object world work is necessary, but how many different objects words must you study? That's a question that comes up. I say, well, at least one, all right? So there's a, you know, greater than one, greater than or equal to one object world. You've got to be, got to have some knowledge of what it's like in an engineering science. The coupling of mathematics with hardware, with laboratory, with, uh, you know, with estimation, with sizing, with whatever, you know, and you know, you know what a heat transfer analysis do. You have, you know when you can, you need it, you know. Etc. Okay, so one one object world, and then I think you ought to uh, be confronted with a lot of problems that bring you up close to other disciplines, whether those are technical or legal or economic or whatever. And you should learn. You don't have to learn that discipline in depth, but you should learn enough to know when they're uh, trying to pull the wool over your eyes, and uh, when, and, and at least how to ask an intelligent question of another person. And of course, there's a lot of trust involved in this. We don't. Uh, that's a very important element in this. There's a lot of trust, in, you know, in what you know and how you learn. There's a lot of trust going on. You know, we give our students textbooks. They trust what they read there. F is equal to M A. You know, and you can't question that. You trust what your instructor, the teacher, is telling you. In the same way, when you go into a design situation at a firm, you trust 
that that person, that, that's uh, from the electrical department and you're from the mechanical, knows what they're talking about, is using the best available, and, and that is explaining as best they can to you. And you try to listen, and uh, that's another thing. Engineers have to listen better. You try to listen and respond in a similar way. And this is, uh, again, some, someone asked a question about Habermas. Mm -hmm. Habermas was big on this. So I'd have them all read Habermas, maybe. And, and that would be one thing. But I don't take it that they have to cover a lot of different fields. I think it's, and uh, the other thing I object to is, is our students have to be, I, I think I said this tonight, ethical. So you send them off to take an ethics course, send them over here, writing course. And I don't think that's the way to do it. I, I think, um, well, it, I think we as engineering faculty, if we're truly scholars, if we think we're, if we claim to be PhD people, we ought to be able to deal with those questions and teach that stuff, you know. And uh, work with colleagues, if we don't know, we ought to go over to the other side of campus and learn something, you know, and sit down, take a seminar, invite them into our class. Really, need, not as a turn teacher, not just to do their shtick and, and to, you know, to satisfy the credit limit or something, but actually to engage with them. I think this is what we need more of. Do you like maybe one more? Go ahead. You were talking about your interest in history of science, and you used the metaphor of the telephone. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in how you place the significance of the internet, because I've had mm -hmm. it explained to me that the internet is the great triumph of engineering, yeah. but at the same time, it is the, the thing more than anything else that has changed the sociology of the world around us. Oh. Well, well there's, last, there's, can I just read one for your last question? Yeah, <laughs> surely there's a lot going on there, and I, you know. It's like uh, how will history judge George Bush? I mean, well, it's probably not like that at all. <laughs> but I mean, it's going to take a long time before we figure out what the hell is going on these days. I mean, an awful lot is going on, and I find it very exciting. You know, I mean, that I can dial up, and get my email from anywhere in the world. I just came back from Denmark, you know, and with secure file transfer and everything. Uh, and I don't even use Skype. You know. <laughs> I mean, there's an awful lot going on. And just the applications we have, you know, what you can do with it. Look at those images. I threw together those in half an hour, pulling them down from where Terry can't distribute this production anywhere because of the copyright laws. But for a one-time shot, yeah, Terry. I'm an open source guy. No, but <laughs> yeah, I spoke to my lawyers before I came out here. Said, oh, good idea. You know, I, you can't, you know, I can use those in an educational presentation, <laughs> okay. and if it's not used for commercial presentations. Mm -hmm. But I was able to pull this down, put those, I don't know what you thought of them, but I, I found, you know, it was kind of, I had fun doing that. You know, what, what, I did that, I started over in Denmark, finishing up here. Okay? All right. All right, that's good, thank you. Yeah, good.